Welcome to the Cosmos Safari Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be speaking with Richard Wright. Richard has many years of experience in the astronomy community. He has over 20 years at SoftwareBIS developing their The Sky software and has extensive background in doing astrophotography himself. Richard has recently written an article for Sky and Telescope where he's speaking about the future of astrophotography, which he thinks is going to be very heavily on the side of doing live stacking using GPUs, um, graphic processing units um, that you would normally think of that are used for gaming um, for the purpose of doing a lot of the legwork within our astrophotography stacking process and using things like artificial intelligence to analyze our images in real time. So this is a really intriguing podcast. Richard and I are going to be meeting in person for the first time in about two weeks up at the NEAC conference, which is the Northeast Astronomical Imaging Conference, where we're going to be meeting with some of the top vendors and top astrophotographers in the world and discussing how to do astrophotography, what the next steps in astrophotography will look like. And Richard has two presentations at NEAC that he does talk about in today's podcast. And we've decided that after the NEAC conference, it's going to be a pretty good idea to get back together and rehash some of the things that we learned and some of the things that we found interesting while we were at the conference. So tune in today. Um, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe so that you find out about future podcasts. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Live stacking is something that I really am getting interested in. And you have recently been talking a lot about it. I know you were down at the Winter Star Party talking about live stacking for astrophotography. Um, I saw that you have an article in Sky and Telescope. And I thought, who better to ask about what live stacking is and how I can kind of get started, not just doing live stacking, because I've done that, but to actually use it to try to produce uh, high quality astrophotography. And I know you, your article says that this is the future of astrophotography. And I thought I would pick your brain today and see why you think that is and how you would go about that process, because I know it's a little bit different than what I'm used to. Okay, sure. Well, um, live stacking is nothing more than what we're already doing. Just it's uh, while you wait. Uh, or why you watch. So, you know, in computers, I've been in computers a long time and there's like real time computer stuff. There's stuff that used to start and you'd have to wait a couple of minutes and then it got to where you could use the mouse and drag it around and it does it while you're dragging around. It's like, that's real time. And so live stacking is just simply stacking that happens while you're imaging. So the traditional, I, I guess, like what is stacking, um, we can't take a three hour single exposure image of a deep sky object for lots of reasons, uh, you know, tracking, saturating the sensor, all of that sort of thing. And so uh, we take lots of short exposures, um, say you're shooting the Pleiades. So you take a, a one minute exposure and then you take another one minute. And at the end of the night, you got, you know, a hundred one minute exposures of uh, the Pleiades. And so then you feed it the PixInsight or AstroPixel processor or any one of a number of programs. And it adjusts the image, lines up the stars, and then it adds them all together um, and uh, averages them. Adding average, it, it has the same net effect. It, the goal isn't to make your image brighter, uh, but it's to make the, the noise go down. So the, the biggest contributor of noise in low light photography is called shot noise. And that's just simply like the pitter patter of little photons on your sensor. You know, we, you, we've all seen this with when it rains, a good soaking rain shower, the sidewalk is soaking wet. When, um, when you just sort of like, would it please just rain or not rain and make up its mind, you get these little drippies everywhere. And it's, you know, drip drops here and there and the sidewalks partially dry and partially wet. 
The same thing happens when you're taking a photo of the Andromeda galaxy. The middle of the galaxy is sending out all these photons, and out at the edges of the galaxy, there's just a few photons. And so the galaxy core, with a short exposure, you're going to get plenty of photons. You get a nice wet image where you get a clean image. Out as you get further away from the core, it's dimmer, and you just get little drip drops of photons. And you can see, I can kind of see where the arms are, but they're very noisy. They're very speckly, right? And that's called shot noise. And so we take lots of exposures, and then we add them all up together. And what that does is it makes that shot, it collects more and more light from those dim areas. So the shot noise goes down, you get a nice smooth image in the dark areas. And now you can go and stretch it and, and you know, uh, adjust the colors and, and all of that sort of thing. So we've been doing this for years, um, taking long exposures, five, 10 minutes, we do auto guiding and we get a folder full of images and then then we, you know, process them, and sometimes it takes an hour. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours to, to, you know, calibrate and stack them all. What live stacking is, is we shorten the exposures even more. Uh, maybe they're only ten or fifteen seconds, and then every image, as soon as the image downloads on the computer, the software immediately combines it with all the images that came before it, and so you can watch live while it stacks. Therefore, we have right. live stacking. So all it is is the traditional life, the traditional stacking process happening live while you watch, while you image. And live stacking, they could still be five minute exposures. Um, I wrote the live stacking routine for Software Bisks, the Sky Professional. And I remember live stacking five minute images just, you know, I'm doing five minute images and I would save all the images and I could go back and process them the traditional route later. But I could also watch real time uh, because I like to watch the data come down and I could watch the image develop. And initially you get a, a very faint image. You drag the slider and you can see the whole galaxy and another image adds up and it's, oh, it looks a lot better. And then another image is like, oh, a little bit better. Oh. Little bit better and so on so i've invested in a telescope and a mount that is capable of doing traditional astrophotography and i know a lot of people have mm -hmm. is there going to be a benefit for something for someone like me who already has equipment that's capable of tracking to a high precision to go to a shorter exposure um or is it still going to be beneficial to do the longer exposures or is it six of one and half a dozen of the other? I've been doing a lot of experiments uh, along these lines. So I have three paramounts and they're pretty well known for being able to do long, um, you know, unguided exposures. So ooh, you can go a really long time. And there's, there's some pros and cons and there's some caveats uh, to it. You know, if you take uh, one five-minute exposure and uh, somebody bumps them out, that five-minute exposure is garbage. It's gone. If you take five one-minute exposures and somebody bumps them out uh, or there's a little something in the gears, uh, you, you lose one-minute exposure and you still got four minutes worth of exposure time. So duty cycle-wise, uh, there's some benefit to doing shorter exposures as far as if you're losing images on a regular basis. Um, I, was, um, I was doing a, a, a review for a mount with really bad periodic error, and I couldn't do very long exposures because they would have, you know, I ended up throwing away almost half the exposures. If I had taken shorter exposures, I probably could have kept more of them. Um, and so that's a, that's a direct benefit of doing you know, shorter exposures. Now there are numerous drawbacks. One is you have to have space to store all these images. And if you're getting 75 megabit, megabyte images for each image, they're going to add up uh, pretty quick. Um, if you're taking 10 or 15 second exposures and it takes your software 10 or 15 seconds to download it and display the image, you're losing half your time uh, to overhead right. take, taking uh, the image. Um, and then, of course, there's a limit to, well, how short can you go? 
theoretically with the perfect camera, uh, you know, you could stack one second exposures and it would be just as good as taking a, you know, a 10 minute exposure. Um, but there aren't any perfect cameras. Uh, there may not be, we may get really close to it in our lifetime, but right now it, it depends on the target you're shooting. You might can get away with one minute exposures. You might can get away with 10 second exposures. Uh, it depends on the camera you have. It depends on the focal ratio of your telescope. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's been some people who say focal ratio doesn't matter. Um, and I just wonder if they've only ever shot with an F10 telescope and they don't Right. <laughs> Try it. I have. Try it. I have for the first time. <laughs> uh, Celestron sent me an 11 inch Rasa, and it is yeah. just unbelievable. And I, you know, tried to do a 30 second exposure, and in my parents' backyard, which is relatively dark, mm -hmm. it blew it all out. And I just, yeah. I couldn't believe it that you know on my Sony A7S3, which is supposed to be a great you know, low light camera with, you know, decent well depth and all that kind of stuff just couldn't handle it. It, it was that capable. Um, so yeah, definitely F uh, ratio uh, matters. Yeah, um, I, I also think about, you know, airplanes um, and satellite trails and how rather than, you know, I know you can Sigma stack Sigma clipping, I guess is something that would mm -hmm. start to, you know, on a more pixel by pixel basis, make that not a, an issue. Um, but I can imagine that shorter exposures are going to hurt that process. It's only going to help uh, reduce the number of affected pixels mm -hmm. per image as that satellite or as that airplane flies through the image, which is helpful. Um, so there's there's that that I can see the benefit for. Um, I know that you've mentioned, uh, you know, in our other conversations about, you know, the mount that is not even an equatorial mount now, one that is, you know, a more of an Altaz mount that is still tracking, um, that that could potentially now become a better astrophotography uh, mount even. Mm -hmm. um, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, there's, um, I just recently became aware of a guy, uh, I don't remember his name, a, a love to give you a reference to it but if you search uh deep sky photography with a sky watcher dobsonian you'll probably come come across it but he he's got a whole geez it's like a book uh but he has a 10 inch or or so sky watcher uh go to dob that does tracking and um every now and then he has to push it to recenter the object actually he doesn't even do that uh nina has a recenter object or, or something like that and he's been doing 10 second exposures on an altaz dob and he's getting phenomenal results uh, now you know bear in mind there's only so much light a lot common misconception you know there's only so much light coming from these objects if you need two hours to get a smooth image you're still going to need two hours you can't just live stack for 30 minutes and go wow that's as good as a two hour exposure uh, you're still going to need two hours worth of exposure time to collect enough right, light right. for that sharp image. But he's doing that. He's he's doing long exposures on an Altaz mount with 10 seconds, and he's he's doing live stack with um, with sharp cap. Uh, and then he's, he saves all the live stack images, and then he combines the live stack images in the traditional way later, and, th and that way he's getting uh, very deep images uh, of, of his – of his, of these objects. Um, so no, yeah, I was surprised get... you could go 10 minutes, but yeah, you're going to get field rotation, right? That's okay. The, the, uh, the, the alignment algorithms fix that. So the alignment algorithms looks at the star pattern and it's not doing just what we call translation, which is left, right, up and down. It's also doing rotation and you can sample, it's called sampling and computer graphics geek speak, but you can resample a translated and rotated image and combine it, you know, uh, willy nilly. The only time field rotation isn't, is a problem is if it rotates during a single exposure. So you can't do 30 seconds on most out ads because in a single exposure, the stars are going to rotate and you get swirls. But if you expose short enough, that rotation is small enough that, um, that you can get away with it. So, 
Yeah. And I mean, you would have to make sure that you have enough to be able to crop in. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Right? You're going to lose height, the height of your image is the, is the maximum, like it mm. could rotate 90 degrees and now you're effectively only able to use the center square of whatever yeah. the edges were on that rectangle that they wouldn't be able to be used. But the, this, as long as you have enough to crop in on that object enough to get rid of that edge yeah. that you're yeah. rotating from that, that would work. Yeah. So, and you, don't, you don't need that much space. Uh, I would say it's probably only like 25%. And right. And I mean, everybody crops anyway, even if you're on an equatorial mount, you know, if you, if you shoot from night to night, you're going to get all these border things. And you're going to crop out the middle uh, anyway. And plus, if you have an image this big, you can't see my arms and there's a little galaxy in the middle. Nobody wants to see a big image. No, a little exactly. Thing. So you're going to crop it anyway for framing purposes. Yeah, I, I went a little bit crazy um, and I got a rotator uh, so that I could not have to deal with the night to night thing. Um, and that's awesome, uh, but it's it's extra to deal with. And mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have to deal with that, it and it still works ninety percent of the way or more. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, once I, well, you said the traditional way of of going about this, so I'm going to end up with a single image, even though I've been live stacking for five minutes. So, what happened? That data is all that kept on RAM, and then it's just dumped after we're done. Like, or do I actually still need to have space on my computer, and then it, do I manually get rid of it? It depends. Um, some, it depends on the software you're using. Some software will save the individual images. Some software you can say, just throw it away. I don't care. Save the final results. Um, instead, there's even a plugin for PixInsight, by the way, it'll watch a folder. And every time a new image gets dropped into that folder, it'll calibrate it for you. It'll take your dark and your flat and apply it and it'll rotate it and then present a new stacked uh, image real time while you're while you're wow. imaging. Um, SharpCap does live stack. The SkyX does live stacking. Uh, in the SkyX, um, it's the one I use most because it's the one I wrote. Uh, there's an option to save the files or not save the files. You can also save a SER file, which is a, a video, uncompressed video format, like what, what we use for planetary images. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that helpful to most people, but... Um, I use that sometimes. So from the, you said it has to do with the camera that you're using. Now, when I'm dealing with a camera that has, um, you know, a read noise on it, uh, which some of my cameras do, um, I know a lot of the newer cameras that are coming out are, are a much cleaner output. And is that really what we're seeing here? Is that why this is all of a sudden becoming more possible or is this more of a computer processing thing that our computers are finally at that or is it a kind of combination of both this is this is um mostly it's the camera uh okay. com computers have been you know we've been stacking things we live stacking is not new we've been doing it for a long time uh what's what's happening lately which makes it so exciting is you know the first wave of cmos sensors was terrible and the second wave of CMOS sensors was less terrible. And the third wave of CMOS sensors were cheap and pretty good, decent enough. And then we got to where, well, they're catching up with CMOS CCD. And I remember uh, just a few years ago at the Winter Star Party, I gave a talk about CCD. CMOS is catching up with CCD. And I said, people think catching up means caught, but it's not there yet. And I talked about all the advantages CCD still had over CMOS. And on paper, you know, the camera manufacturers were really quick to go, look, we have lower read noise and that's it. We got lower read noise and it would be on their marketing literature and everything. The problem is read noise is not the only cam is not the only camera noise. There's also dark pattern noise and the CMOS sensors, when the read noise went down, their dark pattern noise was still awful. And um, that's a source of noise. And it, it, it brought the noise floor up pretty high and you could do pretty good work with those CMOS cameras as long as you did a long enough exposure to overcome uh, that noise. And even worse, some of the 
some of the cameras were really bad, the dark pattern noise would change. Like you, they would move around and you would get banding and you can't, you can't calibrate that out. There's no way to get rid of it. It was just right. show up. So you take enough exposures and stack and hope your sigma rejection works. And you really, you really still couldn't do super short exposures. Um, that's changed. Uh, the latest generation of CMOS, not only is the read noise down, but the pattern noise is also down. Um, and that's a combination of the fact that, um, you know, the people who don't make $30,000 cameras have figured out how to make decent electronics uh, with time. And also the sensors, uh, particularly Sony, uh, has been right. making low noise cameras. Because, you know, a, a, a cold hard fact people don't like to hear is uh, nobody cares about astronomy, <laughs> about right. astrophotography. When it comes to the camera market, uh, there's a few people who, oh, it's so nice. I want to do it. But it doesn't drive anything. Uh, astrophotography drives almost none of that. Uh, what drives it is uh, camera phones, self, uh, car phones. car There are more imaging sensors in your car than, than you would believe. Uh, and security cameras and traffic cameras. And guess what? Those cameras need to do low light photography. And machine vision algorithms which can read your license plate and can count cans as they go by on the conveyor belt and can identify the guy that broke into your car. They need low noise images. And that's been driving that. That's because they're high speed. Yeah, they're yeah. very high speed in many cases. Yep. That's what's been driving this technology forward. And we're just getting the, we're reaping the benefits of it. But only now, uh, only now the latest, uh, I would say the, 455, five, five, which everybody was freaking out about just a couple of years ago. I would say that's the first, that was the first, um, there's been more since then, but that was the first really commercial CMOS. Uh, there is very expensive, of course. Uh, you're not going to buy a, you know, a $300 camera is going to do really amazing, phenomenal, beats everything on the market, uh, at least not now. Uh, but, you know, that was the first uh, one where the read noise was low and the pattern noise was low. And now we've got lots of sensors that are, that are coming out uh, with that. And, geez, you know, five more years, another, the next generation of CMOS, it's going to be even better. And you'll be able to do really short exposures on dimmer objects in astrophotography than, than you can right now. Um, a popular question is, well, how short can I go uh, with my camera? And it, it even... I can't give you an answer, even if I know what your camera is. It depends on what you're shooting and what your focal ratio is. If you're shooting, if you're trying to get that faint oxygen bat nebula squid thing, you're going to need some long exposures, um, you know, to, to, to get that to come out. If you're shooting Andromeda or G, a lot of people like to do live stacking demos with M42. Well, no duh. M42 is like one of the brightest things in the sky. You can live stack one second on that and, and do phenomenal with, with most cameras. Um, the answer is you're just going to have to experiment with your camera and your optics and your target that you want to shoot. That You can still, you could do one second exposures, uh, but you might need three hours of one second exposures to equal an hour of five minute exposures. Uh, but when it comes to 10 second exposures, uh, you might get one, you might, you might do that in two hours. If you go 30 Can you seconds, say that again? I might need... Well, I was going to say three hours. Yeah. So, so there is potentially diminishing returns to possibly even to the shorter, it detrimental. Yeah, yeah, the shorter you go, there, there's a point where you're going to start to lose. Um, if if you do one second exposures, if you do enough one second exposures, you can do just as well as anybody with long exposures. But you might have to take more time. So you might, it might, and I'm just making these numbers up, but they're sure, absolutely, they're, they're illustrative. Uh, you know, if I'm doing five minute exposures and you're doing one second exposures, I might get a really nice deep image in an hour or two, and you might have to shoot for three nights, you know, to get something that clean at one second. But do ten seconds and you might get it in two nights, and do thirty seconds and you might do it the same amount of time that I do. Um, I've been doing that this experiment. I'll shoot. 10, I'll shoot, you know, 15 minutes of 10 second exposures and 15 minutes of one minute exposures and then three, five minute exposures and stack them and compare them. 
Um, and it does depend on the object and it depends on the focal right. ratio. But sometimes a stack of 10 second exposures is just as good as anything else. Sometimes it takes a minute. Uh, Would it know. be fairly easy um, to basically within the software say that, you know, you, I look at a histogram, you know, when I'm when I'm shooting um, normally mm -hmm. in, a, in a regular daylight uh, and even in astrophotography, but even more so in the daylight photography, you know, to make sure that I'm properly exposed. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here, right, is just making sure that we're getting some level of a proper exposure on the object of interest. Um, could they do something like with the, with the signal to noise ratio? that is being achieved and recommend like, okay, this isn't quite enough, maybe go to 30 seconds. Um, or is it, is it too difficult to do that with just the data coming in from the camera? So I can't, I can't argue uh, against the, uh, you know, uh, there's a very basic photography principle, which is a well-exposed image is, you know, very easy to process. And that that goes for ball games and weddings, and it goes for astrophotography as well. Um, the the thing that we're doing though is we're cheating. We're not doing a well exposed. We you can't get yeah. a well exposed image. So we're doing as many images as we can. Uh, one thing where I will kind of push back against some of the conventional wisdom is, you know, the getting the histogram off of the left hand side. Um, you know, a lot of times what, what gets it off the left-hand side, it's not the noise from the target you're shooting, it's the sky noise because you're of light pollution. And so yeah. that's that's giving you a false sense of, oh, I'm exposing long enough because I'm off the left-hand side. Yeah, you yeah, because there's a ball game at the school three blocks away and, and all <laughs> the sky is, is is all lit up. Glowing. Or or yeah. the moon or the moon is out. Yeah, the moon yeah. is out. So and now you can't get rid of that in your image because it's dominant uh yeah you just stack lots and lots and lots of uh lots of images uh you can overcome light pollution with additional exposure time um i just a shot lot yeah, a lot of additional exposure time because the um the light pollution and the sky glow also has shot noise associated with it so that's also going to add noise to to your image and shot noise the only way to get rid of shot noise is to stack lots of lots of images together uh to increase the total exposure time so yeah so i don't think there's a way to know for a particular target just to take an exposure and go i want to see what this looks like i've got uh i'm going to share a picture here i did um narrow band a lot of times people are like yeah you can do short exposures but you can't with narrow band and i did one minute narrow band so this is um this is a stack of 162 one minute exposures um with a three three nanometer hydrogen alpha filter so this is one minute narrow band exposures um and I've been told many times you can't do one minute exposures with, with narrowband. This is an F7, by the way. This is on a very, very late model CMOS camera, of course. Uh, Player One Poseidon, by the way, I don't mind plugging them uh, a little bit. Very, very clean. Um, and uh, I did this on the Rosette and I did it on M42. Uh, I got all the HA around the trapezium. Some very nice, very nice HA photos. But the trapezium is super bright, uh, even in HA, so big deal. Uh, Rosette is actually also a pretty bright HA object. So again, sort of like no, no big deal. Uh, a one minute exposure on the Rosette, I could see the Rosette. The one minute exposures of uh, this image, um, all I saw were stars. None of this detail is in a one minute exposure. And if I stretch it really hard, I get sort of a, a big, triangle shaped something is there maybe the shadow of something i don't see the little cone nebula i don't see the fox fur at all nothing comes out at all in an individual exposure and this is probably one of the biggest hang-ups with using short exposures you take one exposure and they want to see they want to see everything um is, is this image up on for our audio listeners is this image up on astrobin 
um, or somewhere else that I can link in the show notes? Uh, no, I just uh, okay. did this recently. Sean Walker used it in his article on life stacking. There's a new, the last issue of Sky and Telescope. I did one on the future of astrophotography, which was about live stacking and um, uh, computational photography and GPUs and how that's going to change astrophotography. Right. Uh, Sean just did one recently on live stacking specifically, and he was doing all 15, 20, 30 second exposures on deep sky objects uh, with cameras. And uh, I showed him this. I said, oh, yeah, it even works for narrowband. And so he put this one uh, in the article. Um, I think it's the issue before the last that just came out. Um, How much benefit of having the, you know, three nanometer chroma filters there, which are, you know, very, uh, very beautiful uh, pieces of glass. Um, <laughs> how much of that is the chroma filters and how much of that do you think is camera? Because um, I know that when I look at some of these images that people do with some of these higher end filters, it's just obvious the stars are sharper and, you know, some of the mm -hmm. narrow band stuff with the less expensive filters just kind of smears things out a lot more. Um, is, is that, do you think part of the sharpness factor that I'm seeing? Um, or is it I, just that level of, of like, you know, detail is possible because of the amount of data that you've collected? I think, well, to be perfectly fair, um, if I'd shot this with five nanometer filters, it would probably look very similar to this okay. uh, because it's very small. Uh, we're not pixel peeping. Uh, my number one astrophotography tip uh, is always the smaller you make the image, the better it looks. Uh, and so this looks really great and sharp because it's very, you know, it's small, it's on your screen. Um, mm -hmm. The three nanometer does give you more contrast. So when I zoom in on it, it's going to look a little better with the three nanometer filter than it does with the five. The five lets in, or the seven, they let in a lot more of, you know, the sky background, light pollution, and you're going to get more noise from that. Uh, so you get better contrast with the narrower, with the narrower filter. Less light comes through, and uh, I should say less undesirable light comes through. And that undesirable light adds noise because it has shot noise associated with it. So yeah, Got three it. nanometers, three nanometers did uh, did help a lot with this with this image. And then, uh, but I would say that's maybe uh, 80, 20, 20 percent was the three nanometers, eighty percent was the clean the camera. The uh, camera, yep. You know, it's a it's a high. It, this is a five seven one, so it's the it's little brother to the four five five Sony sensor. And it was yeah, in the so, yeah. Is that the, that's the predecessor to what basically is in the the sixteen hundred from ASI? Is that, is that accurate? Um, it's the is the APS-C form factor. Yeah, it's um, the, it was mm -hmm. the twenty six hundred. Is it the ZWO twenty six hundred? Is the same camera right sensor? It, it's the same think, sensor. Only uh, player one like player one and qhy are the only two vendors i know of that use the commercial grade sensors the commercial uh, grade yeah. versus the um versus the other ones and there's nothing wrong with the non-commercial grade it's kind of like C cpu processors you know if you buy a if you buy a four megahertz and a, a, a four gigahertz and a three gigahertz pin, uh, you know intel processor they were both made in the same factory uh on the same production line it's just one of them worked at four gigahertz and the other one would only work at three gigahertz. Right. So the right. ZWO is buying the ones that work at a slower clock speed and, um, but they work, you know, and I mean, unless you get 33 frames per second, you know, with a giant, which you, most people don't sure. deep sky, uh, it's no big deal. Um, so so yeah, I have I have used the sixteen hundred. Um, it's a uh, not the same generation that you're using here, and I have yet to been able to get my hands on something that is of this newer generation of CMOS sensors. Would you say that we are at the point where these are on par with CCDs? Um, if not, where are we lacking yet? And I kind of leave it at that. Oh yeah, yeah, CCDs are done. Okay. CCDs are done. Uh, there will always be CCDs. There's applications where CCDs are still better than CMOS. Um, uh, 
CMOS is, is very fragile in a high radiation environment. So for space mm -hmm. applications, we're not launching CMOS sensors into space. Um, if you do, they're not going to last very long. Um, and uh, so, and you can still, uh, there's a Teledyne still makes CD, CCD sensors, but they're prohibitively expensive um, and they're not, um, you know, and, and, and I'm sure they're, they're really great and they're making great strides and read noise and everything, but they're, you know, those are very, very, very high end, very expensive. And that's not going to trickle down to us at all. As far as, um, you know, consumer grade cameras or even prosumer grade cameras. I remember, I remember that, you know, oh, I've never spent $5,000 on a camera. That's ridiculous. Uh, don't ever say never people. It just, yeah. Don't ever say <laughs> never. Um, but you know, in our price range, you know, even, um, you know, you know, from the few hundred dollar cameras to the several thousand dollar cameras, um, you know, my, I would say the last two good CCDs I had was the 16200 um, and the Sony 694. I would say the 694 is actually a cleaner, cleaner than the 16200. The problem is 694 is very small. Uh, the 16200 was much bigger, so it was more popular. But the 694 was um at a trius pro they managed to get the read noise down to about three electrons and uh that was the last competitive ccd um versus uh cmos uh but the the new sony sensors are are better than any ccd that's on the market now for um astrophotography so would yeah would there over. be for just like pure scientific applications, would there be benefits to the live stacking um, for anything that you could foresee? Uh, or, or would it be almost prohibitive to be able to do live stacking in a, in a scientific sense? It, it depends on what kind of science you're doing. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, the need for long exposures is probably never going to go away for some science applications. Um, I've seen things where people are doing exoplanet stuff and, you know, it's down to where the star has to be on the same pixel, you know, every time and it can't move, you know, even a little bit. And uh, some of these exacting, and I'm not an expert on scientific imaging. I know about photometry and a couple other, you know, things like that. Um, so I can't, I'm not, I don't know that I'm qualified to say that, I, I would, I would guess we're going to be at NEAC. We're yeah. going to be at NEAC soon. And I'll, I'm yeah. sure I'll find someone there that I can ask that question I, to. That's fine, Richard. I'm sure there's well, some scientific applications where life stacking could still be used. And there are probably some applications where it's like, no, we really need a longer exposure, um, you know, for this particular data set. So, yeah, for those of you who don't know the, the Northeast astronomical imaging conference, I think I said that correctly. Um, NIAC is going to be uh, coming up in about what two weeks? Yeah, three weeks. Three weeks. And um, Richard and I are going to both be there together, and uh, maybe we could do some kind of a, a recap at some point of NIAC. Yeah. That'd be kind of fun. Sure, sure. I'm giving kind two talks by know. the way. Uh, oh, cool. I didn't of, realize that. Yeah, one of my talks at NIAC is on this topic: uh, past, present, and future of astrophotography. So I'll be talking about live stacking and a little bit about computational photography and GPUs. And how, Do you how separate those two are. things in, in, in like, you know, or, or are they very much part of that same? No. Future? So uh, I guess, you know, where, what's going to happen, I'll give you kind of a little preview, uh, I guess it's kind of the same. Um, yeah. I, I said more or less the same thing in the sky and tall article a few months back, which is, you know, we're limited by camera noise. Um, the camera noise is going to be, um, it's, it's still around one electron is still a lot of, is still a good bit of noise, but it's going to get to where it's going to be negligible. Um, and quantum efficiency is going to be close enough to 100%. And we're going to have F2 and F3 optics everywhere. And what do you do then? I mean, where we go from there, um, the process that we're doing now literally can't be improved anymore. Um, so what are you going to do? You're going to, well, it's time to change the process. And um, the changing of the process is going to look a lot like live stacking. 
but the computer is going to do a lot more than just simply aligning and combining the images. The computer can be doing real time, you know, uh, noise reduction, real time, uh, all, all sorts of all sorts of things, algorithms that don't make sense uh, with a CPU, but a GPU can do. GPU is a it's a part of your computer that does graphical operations, and the GPU can do things hundreds to thousands of times faster than the CPU. And um, not not many people in uh, astro imaging have done a lot to harness that power. There's some exceptions. NVIDIA, uh, not NVIDIA, um, Pixinsight has a uh, CUDA, which works on NVIDIA graphics cards. CUDA is a GPU compute technology. Um, there's a few There's a few places that are using that. Um, the machine learning stuff that Russell, Russell Croman is doing, the machine learning, uh, the AI that you're applying, if you have one of his plugins and it applies some stuff to your image, that's not GPU accelerated. But what he's doing is he's creating the models that are evaluated using GPUs. So it takes him months to build a model. It would have taken him years to build those models with CPU power. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the difference where GPUs are really, um, really kicking in. And that's my day job. I work for a company that specializes right. in that kind of Right. Thing. Like I knew I, I have a new MacBook Pro with the M1 chip and it's mm -hmm. all integrated um, with, you know, GPUs and everything like that and mul multiple cores right there. And I, I kind of see that as the future of computing too. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just, you know, getting smaller and smaller and, the, the capabilities that some of these new um, Macs have, uh, th they show me the future of what computing is going to look like. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is it's a different ball game. I think in in the next ten years or so, we're going to see this, the sizes of everything are going to come down. Um, as as you're saying, the efficiency is going up, but that also means you can you can also make strides in other directions with with size of things and. You know, not everybody wants to lug around an enormous telescope, so I'm sure there's going to be a, a drive towards smaller, portable, and they already are doing some of mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. smaller, more portable, capable uh, equipment. And, um, you know, I'm kind of staring at all my heavy, older-style equipment, uh, which was new two years ago, and going, what am I doing here? This is, uh, this is a treadmill that I didn't expect to be on, mm -hmm. um, and, and here we are. And things are moving already so fast, it's hard to keep up. So that's what I'm here trying to do with this podcast and and, and talking to folks like you uh, to kind of accelerate my, my learning curve, but also just to try to keep up even um, with how fast things are changing. So, and that's why I'm going to NIAC as well. So you're doing one talk on that. What's your other talk about? Um, small computers. So oh, okay, uh, there you go. Yeah, sm using small computers. So uh, f five years ago, I did a talk on um, Raspberry Pis and how people are starting to use them. The, Z the ASI Air had, I think, just come out or was about to come out when I gave that talk. But now we have ASI Air, we have StellarMate, we got AstroBerry and uh, all kinds of little computers. And they don't have, we don't even have to be Linux. There's, you can get little Intel stick computers uh, that run, you know, USB power or a 12 volt computer. And so it's really about using a small computer. What if you don't buy an ASI Air? Can you still get kind of that experience? How would you put it together yourself? Um, so that's, yeah, that's what that talk is, is going to be about. Give me one it's minute. Small. I'm going to, I'm going to cut this real quick. Okay. I want to show you what I'm building. Okay. This is my little, monster right now i'm in the process of making oh okay so i've got pegasus power I, box yep I've, I've had this for a while mm -hmm. um but i just had this separate pc i had been dealing with a laptop i had uh eventually bought a lenovo think uh what are they called Think Center, it's it's one of the Lenovo, you know, tiny computers, but it wasn't like this. This is the Intel Nook, and I saw a really good deal on Amazon for the Intel Nook, 
Um, yeah. And it just, I couldn't help it because uh, with the Pegasus um, Ultimate Power Box V2, they make, this is a little bracket that they make that fits exactly the same exact form factor. And it's just too pretty looking. It's too clean. Um, and then I realized I could put my, uh, my finder scope or my uh, guide scope, I should say, on top here. So I just got the bolt um, right before I, we started this podcast that I could then connect this guy on here. And I'm in the process of buying these one foot little wires so that I can get rid of all this rat's nest yeah, that I've yeah. been dealing with. And I, I'm hoping to keep everything mounted on a single lost Mandy dove st- uh, dovetail plate here. Um, I've got two Lost Mandy DVA um, adapters that I'm going to be able to take this whole thing mm-hmm. and I'm going to be able to move it from telescope to telescope with just two knobs. And it'll be all but a single wire is going to be coming down from it. Power. And, yep. And and it should be somewhat indexed on that mount if I if I just, you know, put a little line on where I'm connecting it to. That yeah. I should be you know with within reason i should be able to r- remove it put it on a different scope image take it off that scope put it back on and it should be pretty well set up um yeah and it's it's solid you know so this is about as lightweight as i get uh which is still extremely heavy but uh yeah that's been my little project here that i've been working on i'm excited about that Nice. I'm doing a lot of this, a lot of this stuff for Celestron now. As I said, they sent me a a Rasa 11, and I want to be able to move that from my scope to some of these other scopes that I'm reviewing, so that I can, you know, quickly look at them, quickly make determinations of you know how well they're working, and mm-hmm. you know not miss a beat uh, in that process because I have very very finite amounts of extra time to be doing this and the weather where I'm at is always terrible. So yeah. uh, the faster I can make that swap between telescopes, the better um, or, or mounts for that matter. So yeah, uh, you know, we'll be at NIAC, uh in about two weeks, mm-hmm. probably right around the t- same time that this podcast finally makes uh, air and Richard, um, you know, we could certainly talk more when we get to NIAC and maybe we can come up, uh, with a handful of things to discuss um, on a future podcast, you know, give everybody a recap of what oh, we yeah. learned while we were there. I'm sure that, you know, I'm going to be learning things um, both from you as well as from the other speakers. I'm really hoping to get there and really refine my personal process um, because at my work where I run an observatory um, for my local high school um, and for the public, I just want to be able to produce astrophotography that, you know, can get people excited about astronomy and get them to come out and to, to, to look at the telescopes. Uh, I don't need anything that's spectacular in that respect. But the other half of what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to um, use the observatory for the purpose of doing scientific research, which is kind of why I asked you the question earlier. Um, I see, you know, high schools uh, becoming more and more competitive in uh, getting people for sports and other activities like that. And I think we we sometimes forget that just like there are D1 schools for uh, sports, that there are R1 schools for research. And, I, you know, I can only imagine what it would look like to a, a competitive you know, program for college to look at a student coming out of high school with research experience, actual research experience. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to be able to provide that um, with the astronomy program that I'm doing, as well as possibly some other stuff um, as well. So that's my goals. Um, do you have any personal goals for NIAC? Uh It's more of a networking um meet up with friends event with me so you know i've worked in the vendor community for two decades so i've got a lot of friends i got to see them a lot of them at aic some of them i still haven't seen yet so i'm looking forward to um mostly the mostly the networking and seeing seeing the people 
but secondarily, there's going to be some interesting product announcements. Uh, they're going to be there. Uh, I know about a couple of them that I'm not allowed to talk about um, that I want to put my hands on and, and talk to people. Plus, you know, you can, you can talk, you can send emails and uh, there's nothing like talking to someone face to face. It engenders, you know, uh, trust and, you can usually get more out of people. People will tell you more things in person than you're going to see on the website. So it's 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 a really great way to get to be in the know. You just have to show up at these things and talk to people and walk around uh, to be in the know and to see where the industry is going. Uh, you can't tell where the industry is going by reading a f- forum on cloudy nights. Um, so right. Yeah, yeah. When, I, I'm when, I'm also doing the two nights, uh, the program at night as well, mm-hmm. and I'm hoping for clear skies because I'm told that if there is uh, reasonably good skies, that sometimes people will break out the telescopes and actually mm-hmm. show mm-hmm. you some of this stuff in action, which yeah. would be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't guarantee that, unfortunately, but if it happens, I'll be very happy. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I've seen that before. People doing imaging in the parking lots and that sort of thing. So. All right, Richard. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, sure. I really look forward to seeing uh, the future of astrophotography as you've put it here with the live stacking. And maybe once again, once I get after uh, the NIAC and we have a chance to talk in person because um, we've never met in person. No, um, not in person. So I'm interested no. in meeting you, man. That's going to yeah. be kind of cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've been working together on things over the last, few months and and now we'll get a chance to meet so that's fun um but yeah i'll hopefully get a chance to talk more live stacking and maybe i can have some images to uh to show maybe later this summer once once my life uh frees up a little bit cool cool all right well thanks for having me so much it's been fun all right take care bye thank you again for watching the cosmos safari podcast Today's podcast was brought to you by my Patreon subscribers. If you have any interest in helping us, please consider becoming one of our patrons. All of your combined efforts are what make this podcast possible and allow us to keep the high quality that we try to bring to you each month. And in the future, we hope to continue to bring the community of astrophotographers and astronomers to the podcast And by doing this type of work uh, and providing you with these interesting people to talk to, I want to give back to you by allowing you to ask questions of these guests through our Patreon page. So if you're interested in talking about astrophotography or astronomy um, or science in general with any of our guests, please consider uh, joining the Patreon and you'll have your opportunity to ask all the questions you'd like, and we will do our best to continue to provide a high quality educational podcast for you. Thanks everybody. And keep looking up.